Uh... Um, so, yeah. Fascism is a thing now. I mean, just look outside. There's fascists everywhere. What the hell? At least, you know, people are saying that fascism is a problem. And people are saying that it's not. And Donald Trump and authoritarianism. Bad? The idea that Donald Trump is a fascist is something that has been floated around ever since 2016 when he was elected. I myself have also called Donald Trump, the orange man, a fascist. And with the recent developments regarding the post office and federal troops being put in to suppress protests, it's something that has been floated more and more. But is that comparison fair? I don't know. Well, I know that there will be a bunch of cool kids in the comments say that, well, you can't actually be a fascist today, because the only true fascists are the fascists who were in Italy in 1939, so actually you, you can't be that, because you're not a member of the fascist party. So there. This comparison also comes up a lot with Nazis. And then we have these people who say that, well, it's not really about party affiliation, it is about the ideology of the individual. So essentially we're left with three sides. On one hand we have people who think that they have read their history and are making historical comparisons because they don't want fascism to be around and they can see the early warning signs. And then we have people who think they've also read their history claiming that you can't make those wild historical comparisons because you know, times are different, and party membership. And then there's us, the historians, truly the omnicentrists of all political discourse, saying, well, it's complicated. So, is Donald Trump a fascist? Is one of those questions that is very hard to answer. Not just because of who the Donald is, but because everything that we need to know in order to even answer that question in the first place is also very complicated. So let's begin to talk about what even is an ideology. Oh, hello. Welcome to my bed. In this bed, we only discuss four things. Ideology, history, and tonight we are going to discuss the most erotic of topics. Political ideology. Namely, what even is ideology? I mean, when you really get down to it. Everyone knows the words of, oh, it's a system of beliefs and values that dictate your political inclination, but you know, that doesn't work. I should start with addressing the people who have Karl Marx avatars who are already furiously writing in the comments trying to answer the question of what I'm talking about. In the classical Marxist sense, ideology is a way for the ruling classes to manipulate everyone else into believing that the world is the way it is because it's supposed to be. You can see this manifest itself everywhere. For example, when people say that poor people should just work harder. They are coerced by the ideology of capitalism that says that if they are poor, they just didn't work hard enough. Maybe I'm poor because I just need to work harder. Or if you want to be really edgy about it, it's like being in the matrix. And it basically just means that the way that you were raised, the circumstances of your growing up, all of these things affect how you view the world. And because those in power can dictate how society should be like, and most notably the circumstances of you growing up, specifically what you were taught in school, those circumstances are manipulated by the people at the top, primarily for their own benefit, so that they don't have to give up their position of power. The function of ideology is to stabilize and perpetuate dominance through masking or illusion. Sally Haslinger. This is what people mean when they say that everything is ideology. In short, it sort of translates to worldview, both in the sense of how you view the world, but also how you view relationship between people. One example is religion as a sort of ideology in the Middle Ages, where people would view their relationship as mortals subservient to God, and by extension, the kings, who are just an extension of God's love. They don't question the system because the ideology of religion has told them that there's no point. This is the way society should be like. 
An ideology differs from a simple opinion in that it claims to possess either the key to history or the solution to all of the riddles of the universe, or the intimate knowledge of the hidden universal laws which are supposed to rule nature and man. Hannah Arendt. A Marxist analysis would say that the bourgeoisie class does basically the exact same thing. Or, if you're a racist, you can say that the world is the way it is because of the superiority of a race or some shit like that. This is grossly oversimplified what ideology is. But we are talking about political ideology. And that's why you're here. Political ideologies are basically the existence of a set of mutually compatible opinions. The gist of it is that you have your own life experience and you have your own values, and you combine those things to form your own worldview. For example, consider persons in the United States attempting to decide whether they will support a policy, say, one that gives benefits to out-of-work persons in American inner cities, who are likely to be of Afro-American descent. Our imaginary citizen first draws on his ideological values, let's say equality and fairness, and then combines these with what he knows about the world, that there is a great deal of unemployment, and that the changing economic structure and persistent racism make it hard for American blacks to get jobs no matter how hard they try, and produce an opinion, in this case to favor the policy. In sum, according to this conception, values plus beliefs equals opinion. Attitudes are a fusion of otherwise separable prescriptive and descriptive cognitive elements. Because a lot of people have very different values and also very different life experiences, they will develop different ideologies. And that's why we have political parties. However, ideologies only really start existing when these ideas are mutually compatible with each other. It would be almost impossible to form a political ideology based, for example, on personal freedom while also advocating a sort of police state. And <laughs> who would ever do that? But that's what political ideology is, which is a very different thing from political opinion. Everyone can have political opinions about basically anything, and they don't have to be mutually compatible with each other. It's only when these opinions become mutually compatible with each other that they can form a collective ideology that spans many different political opinions and forms a one cohesive worldview. An ideology then doesn't only exist on how you view the world, but it also shows you the way you want the world to be, and perhaps more importantly, how you want to get there. But here's the rub. What if you don't have an end goal or a method? What if you only want power? Oh, hello. Welcome to fascism. Wow, we're back in full-on bread tube lighting. What is this, 2018? Yeesh. So, what even is fascism? Well, it seems like fascism is one of those things that everyone knows what it is, but it's very hard to communicate to someone else what it is. So, I keep seeing this sign. All the people love this sign. It's such a good sign. Look at it. It has, it's so easy. If you just, like, these are the warning signs. And if you, if you have the warning signs, then that's fascism. It's, it's fascism. This is the, this is what fascism is. I don't really like this sign. I think it's overly simplistic. But it does very much encapsulate what a lot of people think fascism is. But if you look at it, the sign doesn't actually say that much at all. And it's not wrong, per se. It's just very general. As in, I feel like I can apply every one of these points to America as it is today. Or even to America as it was in 2016, before Donald Trump. Am I saying that America is a fascist state? Am I saying that? Am I saying that America is a fascist state? Am I actually saying that America was a fascist state even under Barack Obama? Am I actually saying- Obviously, all of these examples are present in historical examples of fascism, which is kind of everything that we have to go on. One of the big problems of discussing fascism is that there hasn't really been a sort of fascist canon discussing what it is or what it should be. There have been individual fascists 
and fascist states that have produced literature on the subject, but they are all very different from each other. But what are the commonalities? What is unique about fascism? Well, that's sort of the hard part. Political scientists and historians really struggle with this quite a lot. Modern day and historical fascists have a lot of things in common, usually in terms of ultra-nationalism and far-right populism. But one thing that I feel like a lot of people ignore is that fascism, as an ideology, actively wants to destroy the current ideology and replace it with its own. So while we exist within the ideology of our current society, wanting to win elections and wanting to reform the society the way we want, fascists want to dismantle all of that. But they are still willing to exploit the current system in order to do that. The idea is that this new will be better than the alternative, but it can always be pretty vague what that is. And this new system is one that is usually very dictatorial. And this is why some people say that we can't classify Donald Trump as a fascist because he doesn't want to dismantle American democracy. Uh, or at least he hasn't gone out to say that the current system must be destroyed. And of course, no one today is going to openly admit to wanting to destroy democracy. Discussing the failures of democracy today is seen as very taboo. If there's something we learned from history, it is that people denouncing democracy as a sort of evil incarnate is something that we should be very cautious about. But then begs the question, can we only call someone a fascist if they are openly fascistic. But how can we tell the difference between someone who is secretly a fascist and someone who is just taking part of extreme far-right methods? And the problem is, it's really hard to do that. A lot of people will point to Donald Trump dismantling the postal service or putting in federal troops in cities to quell protest as being fascistic. But I think this is a gross misunderstanding of what is actually happening. Fascism is not the same thing as authoritarianism, which leads me to something that has kind of become a problem whenever anyone is discussing what fascism actually is. Fascism has become a bit of a slur. I mean, okay, calm down. <laughs> the idea that fascist is used as a pejorative against someone else that you dislike is not new. I mean, it's happened ever since the World War. Hell, it happened during the Second World War. Even George Orwell commented on this in 1944, before the end of the Second World War. Except for the relatively small number of fascist sympathizers, almost any English person would accept bully as a synonym for fascist. That is about as near to a definition as this much abused word has come. And this makes it hard to do an analysis of what fascism is, because we can't rely on people being described as fascists. And because almost no one is going to self-describe or self-identify as a fascist, the term has become almost useless. Donald Trump using federal troops to quell protests is not something that is new to Donald Trump. In fact, a lot of presidents have used that power before. I'll happily call people authoritarian, but that's a different issue. In fact, this is one of the reasons that I don't really want to label Donald Trump as a fascist, even though he embodies a lot of the criteria about what fascism could be, I don't think he fully embodies the idea of what fascism is, or at least has been. And, but this is where things get complicated, because, and I don't know if you know this, but the world has changed since 1945. Because fascism is inherently very outdated, it is almost impossible for anyone in a current climate to actually be a fascist. And that's not because they're not a member of the fascist party or whatever, it's just because the world operates differently. And so a would-be fascist would have to too. For example, historically, almost all fascist organizations have had their own armed paramilitary wing, but you can't really do that today because at that point you basically have your own terror organization, at which point I don't think people will vote for you. That's not to say that far-right violence or far-right paramilitarism isn't happening. It is, but it's not even close to the paramilitary movements of the early 20th century. Like, it's not. And I'm not trying to defend Donald Trump from the label here. Of course not. I hate the man. But the thing is, we might also learn the wrong lesson from history. 
Drawing historical parallels between Donald Trump and historic movements means that we will either overestimate what Donald Trump is doing right now, or vastly underestimate what happened historically. And while that's not necessarily bad in and of itself, it means that we might misidentify future events when this might happen. Discussions of fascism then also become more dangerous because we don't really know what we're talking about. But the thing is, this is also kind of fine. As I mentioned, the word is used pejoratively against a lot of various far-right movements, and because the world is different today than it was a lot of years ago, and because history has happened, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should be more restrictive with the use of the term. Perhaps we can even use it more liberally. The reason for this is because we don't really know how many of these ideologies would play out in a modern day setting. For example, we don't know what Donald Trump is thinking, or what his plans are, or if he even has any plans at all. But fascism is also a political and economic system. Why then cannot we have a clear and generally accepted definition of it? Alas, we shall not get one. Not yet, anyway. And so at this point, fascism takes on a sort of modern application. Do we only want to use it as a sort of historical ideological framework in which to label people, or do we want to use it as a sort of political scarecrow? And the thing is, if it does the job, then that's fine. But the thing is, you don't necessarily have to be fascist in order to perform fascism. What I mean by this is that a lot of politicians might adopt fascistic ideas or methods in their own programs while not necessarily wanting to go all the way, so to say. And because this is happening more and more in a more complicated political landscape, it is almost impossible to say whether or not someone is a fascist. It might be more appropriate to ask if they are doing fascism. Fascism also often defines itself by hatred of democracy, and you can't really find a lot of people who will outspokenly speak against democracy. And that's not what Donald Trump is doing either. Instead, what Donald Trump is doing is saying that his rule is the truest expression of democracy. But rather, he is arguing that he is the legitimate ruler because he has the most legitimate votes. Trump being president, then, is the most true expression of democracy that is not hampered down by the sort of decadence and hamperings of the old regime. And the thing is, there is um, there's someone else that we need to talk to when we're talking about this. So let's, let's leave a fascism for a bit. And let's talk more about Donald Trump. So it comes down to this. The orange man. Is he a fascist? So Donald Trump is one of those people who sort of defies any type of classification because he doesn't really seem to have any type of ideology outside of project power, show confidence, own the libs, and triggering the libs isn't really an ideology. Now some people argue that the ideology of Donald Trump is the ideology of the Republican Party, but the Republican Party doesn't really have that much of an ideology. Especially since in the recent convention, they didn't even bother to present the platform. So instead of establishing what ideology that they are, they're just establishing that they're going to follow the leader. They're going to follow Donald Trump no matter what. And remember, ideology is different from political opinion, and Donald Trump definitely has a lot of those. Because of this confusion around him, some people have taken to call his ideology Trumpism, which Sure, but if every individual can have their own political inclinations, then that kind of defeats the purpose of having political labels at all. Because it doesn't really align to any already established ideological system, people try to look to history to see if they can find examples of other people who have acted in a similar way. So people compare him to far-right historical figures because of his sort of appeals to far-right populism and ultra-nationalism. Which, sure, but I think a better comparison would be Napoleon Bonaparte. Remember, historically, fascists want to destroy the system that they exist within and set up their own. But that's not what Donald Trump wants. Napoleon, as in that guy, recognized the ideological system that he existed within and managed to exploit it for his own personal political gain. 
He's not here to make friends, he's here to gain power. Napoleon was not driven by an ideology that he believed in. He was driven by a lust for power, and as such was willing to sacrifice many of the ideals that he claimed to have in order to consolidate power to himself. This is more commonly known as Caesarism. This is where politicians pretend to uphold the actual values of the ideological society they exist within. So Caesarists talk about preserving the values of the old order, whereas fascists are openly hostile to those values, instead wanting to create a new regime, a new order. Or they pretend to defend even older values that outdate the previous regime. The goal and method here is to centralize power to the leader. And while this is very different from fascism, but because this Caesarism is still a big part of what fascism is, we can still say that while Donald Trump might not be a fascist, he's definitely doing fascism. And yet, despite of all this, people still seem obsessed with finding a political label that they can apply to Donald Trump. We must find a label for Donald Trump. We have to know what to call him. If we don't, we will repeat the mistakes of the past. We will not learn from our history. We're all gonna be doomed. Oh my god, you're back in my bed. I swear to god, you're getting a bit clingy. I feel like there is a propensity for people who engage in our sort of discourse to have a bit of a um, history fetish, or more history clinginess. First of all, isn't it weird? As I mentioned earlier, the world is different now than it was before. So how come so much of political ideology right now revolves around the thinking of people who haven't been like around for a hundred years, whose political ideologies were basically born, birthed so long ago? I mean, yes, there have been political thinkers in the last couple of decades, but honestly, when we're talking about ideas like conservatism, communism, socialism, whatever, people almost always exclusively refer to the originals, the OGs. Even when talking about ideological clashes, I see this all the time. I remember a few years ago when I was still exploring my own sort of political inclinations. And I was running around the university and I came across these people who were arguing almost to the death about the Spanish Civil War. And these were politically active student union activists, right? They were people who really wanted to make a change in the world. And they belonged to the same political party, but they couldn't decide on how they wanted to steer the party. There was no unity, they just kept arguing. But the argument didn't have anything to do with the current student union platform. They just talked about the Spanish Civil War. And I couldn't fathom why. Why was that relevant? Why was this even relevant to anything that we're talking about? And I realized it's not actually about the Spanish Civil War. It's because to find ideological legitimacy, you always look to history for a sort of ideological victory. Now, I didn't take any sides, but the communist was saying if it wasn't for the anarchists, then Franco wouldn't have won. And the anarchist was saying, well, if it wasn't for the Stalinists, they wouldn't have to have revolted in the first place. And it's the Stalinists' fault that Franco won. And they were just trying to bolster up their own wing of the internal party. And I can still see the same sort of thinking today. It seems that when people talk politics, they very much separate their ideology from their political opinions. Because they know that the ideology that they might subscribe to might not be super practical currently. And while this might be seen as pragmatic in a lot of scenarios, it also seems to me to call for a need for a more updated political vocabulary. Maybe the reason why people feel the need to be so pragmatic all the time is because they are blinded by the ideology that they exist within already. And that includes the political ideologies that they also subscribe to themselves. I feel like this manifests itself in a lot of different ways, where people of all sorts of political ideologies will say, well, this could have happened, and this should have happened, and if we had done this, then we could have avoided this. But maybe the most familiar example of this is, Bernie would have won. And while it's still very recent history, it's still this clinginess to history that doesn't actually contribute that much to current discourse. And it kind of sucks because I feel like 
in a sort of way, there is an over-reliance on history, which to me as an historian is almost profane to say. But it doesn't change the fact that I feel like sometimes we can let history go. To many though, ideology is just about labeling people, to have a flavor for someone else to see if they like it or not. But that's not always great. The most common question I get, above all, is what do you identify as? In terms of politics, not gender, that's obvious. People simply have to know which dead philosopher from the 19th century do I stand? And I have avoided the question a little bit. Firstly, I don't really want to label myself as anything if I can avoid it. If I label myself as anything, people will come in with preconceived notions about what it is that I believe. And considering my job is telling people what I believe, it would sort of not be super great for my career. I sometimes joke and describe myself as a Mia Mulderist because, honestly, I feel like my very specific belief system can't really be defined in any traditional label structure that already exists. I don't really subscribe to any political ideology, not because I'm some sort of omnicentrist, I have political opinions, but just because nothing fits. And so putting a label on myself would just be misleading, because it wouldn't fully encapsulate what I believe. On another point, I'm Swedish, which means that the political atmosphere that I currently exist within is very different from the one where I usually practice my work. I work on the internet, which unfortunately for me just means greater America. And of course, political discourse exists differently in different countries. So whatever label that I would apply to myself would have one meaning to me here, where I live, and another meaning on the internet, which in turn just leads to even more confusion. There are just too many people online, there are too many politicians, there are too many political parties, there's just too much stuff. So labels help us simplify a lot of the discourse that we're dealing with by sort of chunking down everything that we're talking about. I also don't think that a lot of these ideological disagreements are anything that most people actually care about. The appeal of a lot of populist politicians and authoritarians is that they don't ascribe to any specific ideology. They don't belong to an ideological elite, they just belong to the people. And while talking about minute ideological differences is fine in a purely academic sense, I'm not super sure it's productive. I feel like we can put our discourse to better use. Discussing the ideological tenets of fascism is something that is very academically interesting, but I'm not super sure that it's something very productive. I don't mean to say that this question is irrelevant. It's not. This is my bread and butter, honey. I need this. But I do feel that we can put a lot of our energy into other things. We're not gonna defeat fascism by labeling it. We're gonna defeat it by staying politically productive and by surviving. It will be seen that, as used, the word fascism is almost entirely meaningless. In conversation, of course, it is used even more widely than in print. I've heard it applied to farmers, shopkeepers, social credit, corporal punishment, fox hunting, bullfighting, the 1922 committee, the 1941 committee, Kipling, Gandhi, Chiang Kai-shek, homosexuality, priestly broadcast, youth hostels, astrology, women and dogs, and I do not know what else. Yet underneath all this mess, there does lie a kind of buried meaning. To begin with, it is clear that there are very great differences, some of them easy to point out and not easy to explain away, between the regimes called fascist and those called democratic. Secondly, if fascist means in sympathy with Hitler, some of the accusations I have listed above are obviously very much more justified than others. Thirdly, even if the people who recklessly fling the word fascist in every direction attach at any rate an emotional significance to it. Thirdly, even the people who recklessly fling the word fascist in every direction attach at any rate an emotional significance to it. By fascism they mean, roughly speaking, something cruel, unscrupulous, arrogant, obscurantist, anti-liberal and anti-working class. But fascism is also a political and economic system. 
Why, then, cannot we have a clear and generally accepted definition of it? Alas, we shall not get one. Not yet, anyway. To say why would take too long. But basically it is because it is impossible to define fascism satisfactorily without making admissions which neither the fascists themselves, nor the conservatives, nor socialists of any color are willing to make. All one can do for the moment is use the word with a certain amount of circumspection and not, as is usually done, degrade it to the level of a swear word. And speaking of surviving, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creators, entrepreneurs, and curious people everywhere. You can take classes in creativity, filmmaking, design, or like I deeply need, the Productivity Masterclass, where you can learn to manage your time and boost your creativity. Normally Skillshare costs less than $10 a month, but the first people who click the link in the description of this video get access to Skillshare Premium for free for two months. Thank you for watching that video. I would really like it if you hit the like button and subscribed to my channel. I would like to give special thanks to Alicia Crawford, Alki Historiker, Amalia, Amanda B, Athiette, Austin K, Autumn, Catherine Stenson, Charlie, Christine Gutierrez, Cobra Sphere, Dana Ferguson, Daniel Gollan, Emil Rutkowski, Emilia Clark, Emma Not Goldman, Erin Kitchen, Ezekiel Panepucci, Fox Kant, Huang Wu, Jade C, Jane Lusby, Janelle Torgeson, Yareth Arnold, Jurgen Danielsen, Josie Volps, LPQ Silver, Linus 2.0, Morimer, Mountain Snow, MSG, Natalie Kapoor, Nia Pazaka, Nork 426, Patrick Stack, Phobos 2390, Riley Knox, Safi Hawk, Scary Sun, Zitzries, The Bread Santa, Thoros of Mir, Tiffany A, Uyam Fuhasel, Ultimate Sactibus, Uncle Cheese, Rosie, Vinter, Vivian Crow, Wolfgang the Grand High Exalted Wizard, and Zoya Kent.